Slaughterhouse Five, Chapter Three. The Germans and the dog were engaged in a military operation, which had an amusingly self-explanatory name, a human enterprise which is seldom described in detail, whose name alone, when reported as news or history, gives many war enthusiasts a sort of post-coital satisfaction. It is, in the imagination of combats fans, the divinely listless love play that follows the orgasm of victory. It is called mopping up. The dog, who had sounded so ferocious in the winter distances, was a female German shepherd. She was shivering. Her tail was between her legs. She had been borrowed that morning from a farmer. She had never been to war before. She had no idea what game was being played. Her name was Princess. Two of the Germans were boys in their early teens. Two were ramshackle old men, droolers and toothless as carp. They were irregulars, armed and clothed fragmentar fragmentarily with junk taken from real soldiers who were newly dead. So it goes. They were farmers from just across the German border, not far away. Their commander was a middle-aged corporal, red-eyed, scrawny, tough as dried beef, sick of war. He had been wounded four times and patched up and sent back to war. He was a very good soldier, about to quit about to find somebody to surrender to. His bandy legs were thrust into golden cavalry boots, which he had taken from a dead Hungarian colonel on the Russian front. So it goes. Those boots were almost all he owned in the world. They were his home. An anecdote. One time a recruit was watching him bone and wax those golden boots, and he held one up to the recruit and said, If you look in there deeply enough, you'll see Adam and Eve. Billy Pilgrim had not heard this anecdote. But, lying on the black ice there, Billy stared into the patina of the corporal's boots, saw Adam and Eve in the golden depths. They were naked. They were so innocent, so vulnerable, so eager to behave decently. Billy Pilgrim loved them. Next to the golden boots were a pair of feet, which were swaddled in rags. They were crisscrossed by canvas straps, were shod in hinged wooden clogs. Billy looked up at the face that went to with the clogs. It was the face of a blonde angel of a fifteen-year-old boy. The boy was as beautiful as Eve. Billy was helped to his feet by the lovely boy, by the heavenly andro androgen, and the others came forward to dust the snow off Billy, and then they searched him for weapons. He didn't have any. The most dangerous thing they found on his person was a two-inch pencil stub. Three inoffensive bangs came from far away. They came from German rifles. The two scouts who had ditched Billy and Weary had just been shot. They had been lying in ambush for Germans. They had been discovered and shot from behind. Now they were dying in the snow, feeling nothing, turning the snow to the color of raspberry sherbet. So it goes. So Roland Weary was the last of the three musketeers. And Weary, bug-eyed with terror, was being disarmed. The corporal gave Weary's pistol to the petty, pretty boy. He marveled at Weary's cruel trench knife, said in German that Weary would no doubt like to use the knife on him to tear his face off with the spiked knuckles, to stick the blade into his belly or throat. He spoke no English, and Billy and Weary understood no German. Nice playthings you have, the corporal told Weary, and he handed the knife to, the, to an old man. Isn't that a pretty thing, hmm? He tore open Weary's overcoat and blouse. Brass buttons flew like popcorn. The corporal reached into Weary's gaping bosom as though he meant to tear out his pounding heart, but he brought out Weary's bulletproof Bible instead. A bulletproof Bible is a Bible small enough to be slipped into a soldier's breast pocket, over his heart. It is sheathed in steel. The corporal found the dirty picture of the woman and the pony in Weary's hip pocket. What a lucky pony, eh? he said. Hmm? Hmm? Don't you wish you were that pony? He handed the picture to the old, other old man. Spoils of war. It's yours. It's yours, you lucky lad. Then he made Weary sit down in the snow and take off his combat boots, which he gave to the beautiful boy. He gave Weary the boys' clogs. So Weary and Billy were both without decent military footwear now, and they had to walk for miles and miles, with Weary's clogs clacking, with Billy bobbing up and down, up and down, crashing into Weary from time to time. Excuse me, Billy would say, or I beg your pardon. They were brought at last to a stone cottage at a fork in the road. It was a collecting point for prisoners of war. Billy and Weary were taken inside, where it was warm and smoky. There was a fire sizzling and popping in the fireplace. The fuel was furniture. There were about twenty other Americans in there, sitting on the floor with their backs to the wall, staring into the flames, thinking whatever there was to think, which was zero. Nobody talked. Nobody had any good war stories to tell. 
Billy and Weary found places for themselves, and Billy went to sleep with his head on the shoulder of an unprotesting captain. The captain was a chaplain. He was a rabbi. He had been shot through the hand. Billy traveled in time, opened his eyes, found himself staring into the glass eyes of a jade-green mechanical owl. The owl was hanging upside down from a rod of stainless steel. The owl was Billy's optometry in his office in Ilium. An optometer is an instrument for measuring refractive errors in eyes, in order that corrective lenses may be prescribed. Billy had fallen asleep while examining a female patient who was in a chair on the other side of the owl. He had fallen asleep at work before. It had been funny at first. Now, Billy was starting to get worried about it, about his mind in general. He tried to remember how old he was. Couldn't. He tried to remember what year it was. He couldn't remember that either. Doctor, said the patient tentatively. Hm? He said. You're so quiet. Sorry. You were talking away there, and then you got so quiet. Um, you see something terrible? Terrible? Some disease in my eyes? No, no, said Billy, wanted to doze off again. Your eyes are fine. You just need glasses for reading. He told her to go across the corridor to see the wide selection of frames there. When she was gone, Billy opened the drapes and was no wiser as to what was outside. The view was still blocked by a Venetian blind, which he hoisted clatteringly. Bright sunlight came crashing in. There were thousands of parked automobiles out there, twinkling on the vast lake of blacktop. Billy's office was part of a suburban shopping center. Right outside the window was Billy's own Cadillac, El Dorado Coup de Ville. He read the stickers on the bumper. Visit Ossible Chasm, said one. Support your police department, said another. There was a third. Impeach Earl Warren, it said. The stickers about the police and Earl Warren were gifts from Billy's father-in-law, a member of the John Birch Society. The date on the license plate was 1967, which would make Billy Pilgrim 44 years old. He asked himself, where have all the years gone? Billy turned his attention to his desk. There was an open copy of The Review of Optometry there. It was open to an editorial, which Billy now read, his lips moving slightly. What happens in 1968 will rule the fate of European optometrists for at least 50 years, Billy read. With this warning, Jean Theriart, Secretary of the National Union of Belgium Opticians, is pressing for formation of a European Optometry Society. The alternatives, he says, will be the obtaining of professional status or, by 1971, reduction to the role of spectacle sellers. Billy Pilgrim tried hard to care. A siren went off. Scared the hell out of him. He was expecting World War III at any time. The siren was simply announcing high noon. It was housed in a cupola atop a firehouse across the street from Billy's office. Billy closed his eyes. When he opened them again, he was back in World War II again. His head was on the wounded rabbi's shoulder. A German was kicking his feet, telling him to wake up, that it was time to move on. The Americans, with Billy among them, formed a fool's parade on the road outside. There was a photographer present, a German war correspondent with a Lika. Lika. He took pictures of Billy's and Roland Weary's feet. The picture was widely published two days later as heartening evidence of how miserably equipped the American army often was, despite its reputation for being rich. The photographer wanted something more lively, though, a picture of an actual capture. So the guards staged one for him. They threw Billy into shrubbery. When Billy came out of the shrubbery, his face wreathed in goofy goodwill. They menaced him with their machine pistols, as though they were capturing him then. Billy's smile as he came out of the shrubbery was at least as peculiar as Mona Lisa's, for he was simultaneously on foot in Germany in 1944 and riding his Cadillac in 1967. Germany dropped away, and 1967 became bright and clear, free of interference from any other time. Billy was on his way to the Lions Club luncheon meeting. It was a hot August, but Billy's car was air-conditioned. He was stopped by a signal in the middle of the Ilium's back black ghetto. The people who lived here hated it so much that they had burned down a lot of it the month before. It was all they had, and they'd wrecked it. The neighborhood reminded Billy of some of the towns he had seen in the war. The curves and sidewalks were crushed in many places, showing where the National Guard tanks and half-tracks had been. Blood Brother said a message written in pink paint on the side of a shattered grocery store. There was a tap on Billy's car window. A black man was out there. He wanted to talk about something. The light had changed. Billy did the simplest thing. He drove on. Billy drove through a scene of even greater desolation. It looked like Dresden after it was firebombed like the surface of the moon. 
The house where Billy had grown up used to be somewhere in what was so empty now. This was Urban Renewal, a new Ilium government center and a pavilion of the arts and a peace lagoon and high-rise and high -rise apartment buildings were going up here soon. That was all right with Billy Pilgrim. The speaker at the Lions Club meeting was a major in the Marines. He said that Americans had no choice but to keep fighting in Vietnam until they achieved victory or until the communists realized that they could not force their way of life on weak countries. The major had been there on two separate tours of duty. He told of many terrible and many wonderful things he had seen. He was in favor of increasing bombings, of bombing North Vietnam back into the Stone Age, if it refused to see reason. Billy was not moved to protest the bombing of North Vietnam. He did not shudder about the hideous things he himself had seen bombing do. He was simply having lunch with the Lions Club, of which he was past president now. Billy had a framed prayer on his office wall, which expressed his method for keeping going, even though he was unenthusiastic about living. A lot of patients who saw the prayer on Billy's wall told him that it helped them to keep going, too. It went like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Now he was being introduced to the Marine Major. The person who was performing the introduction was telling the Major that Billy was a veteran, and that Billy had a son who was a sergeant in the Green Beret in Vietnam. The Major told Billy that the Green Berets were doing a great job, and that he should be proud of his son. I am. I certainly am, said Billy Pilgrim. He went home for a nap after lunch. He was under doctor's orders to take a nap every day. The doctor hoped that this would relieve a complaint that Billy had. Every so often, for no apparent reason, Billy Pilgrim would find himself weeping. Nobody had ever caught Billy doing it. Only the doctor knew. It was an extremely quiet thing Billy did, and not very moist. Billy opened a lovely Georgian home in Ilium. He was rich as Croesus, something he had never expected to be, not in a million years. He had five other optometrists working for him in the shopping plaza's location, and netted over $60,000 a year. In addition... He owned a fifth of the new Holiday Inn out on Route 54, and half of three Tasty Freeze stands. Tasty Freeze was a sort of frozen custard. It gave all the pleasure that ice cream could give, without the stiffness and bitter coldness of ice cream. Billy's home was empty. His daughter, Barbara, was about to get married, and she and his wife had gone downtown to pick out patterns for her crystal and silverware. There was a note saying so in the kitchen table. There were no servants. People just weren't interested in careers in domestic service anymore. There wasn't a dog, either. There used to be a dog named Spot, but he died. So it goes. Billy had liked Spot a lot, and Spot had liked him. Billy went up the carpeted stairway and into his and his wife's bedroom. The room had flowered wallpaper. There was a double bed with the clock radio on the table beside it. Also on the table were controls for the electric blanket and a switch to turn on the gentle vibrator which was bottled to the springs of the box mattress. The trade name of the vibrator was Magic Fingers. The vibrator was the doctor's idea, too. Billy took off his trifocals and his coat and his necktie and his shoes, and he closed the Venetian blinds and then the drapes, and he lay down on the outside of the coverlay. But sleep would not come. Tears came instead. They seeped. Billy turned on the Magic Fingers, and he was jiggled as he wept. The door chimes rang. Billy got off the bed and looked down through a window at the front doorstep to see if somebody important had come to call. There was a crippled man down there, as spastic in space as Billy Pilgrim was in time. Convulsions made the man dance flappingly all the time, made him change his expressions, too, as though he were trying to imitate very various famous movie actors. Another cripple was ringing a doorbell across the street. He was on crutches. He had only one leg. He was so jammed between his crutches that his shoulders hit his ears. Billy knew what the cripples were up to. They were selling subscriptions to magazines that would never come. People subscribed to them because the salesmen were so pitiful. Billy had heard about this racket from a speaker at the Lions Club two weeks before, a man from the Better Business Bureau. The man said that anybody who saw cripples working in a neighborhood for magazine subscriptions should call the police. Billy looked down the street saw a new Buick Riviera parked about half a block away. There was a man in it, and Billy assumed correctly that he was the man who had hired the cripples to do this thing. Billy went on weeping as he contemplated the cripples and, and their boss. His door chimes changed hellishly. 
He closed his eyes and opened them again. He was still weeping, but he was back in Luxembourg again. He was marching with a lot of other prisoners. It was a winter wind that was bringing tears to his eyes. Ever since Billy had been thrown into shrubbery for the sake of a picture, he had been seeing St. Elmo's fire, a sort of electronic radiance around the heads of his companions and captors. It was in the treetops, and on the rooftops of Luxembourg, too. It was beautiful. Billy was marching with his hands on top of his head, and so were all the other Americans. Billy bobbing up and down, up and down. Now he crashed into Roland Weary accidentally. I beg your pardon, he said. Weary's eyes were tearful also. Weary was crying because of honorable pains in his feet. The hinged clogs were transforming his feet into blood puddings. At each road intersection, Billy's group was joined by more Americans with their hands on top of their haloed heads. Billy had smiles for them all. They were moving like water, downhill all the time, and they flowed at last to a main highway on the valley's floor. Through the valley flowed a Mississippi of humiliated Americans. Tens of thousands of Americans shuffled eastward, their hands clasped on top of their heads. They sighed and groaned. Billy and his group joined the river of humiliation, and the late afternoon sun came out from the clouds. The Americans didn't have the road to themselves. The westbound lane boiled and boomed with vehicles which were rushing German reserves to the front. The reserves were violent, wind-burned, bristly men. They had teeth like piano keys. They were festooned with machine-gun pelt, belts, smoked cigars, and guzzled booze. They took wolfish bites from sausages, patted their horny palms with potato masher grenades. One soldier in black was having a drunk hero's picnic all by himself on top of a tank. He spit on the Americans. The spit hit Roland Weary's shoulder, gave Weary a forage of snot and blot blotwurst and tobacco juice and schnapps. Billy found the afternoon stingingly exciting. There was so much to see. Dragon's teeth, killing machines, corpses with bare feet that were blue and ivory. So it goes. Bobbing up and down, up and down. Billy beamed lovingly at a bright lavender farmhouse that had been spattered with machine-gun bullets. Standing in its cockeyed doorway was a German colonel. With him was his unpainted whore. Billy crashed into Weary's shoulder, and Weary cried out sobbingly, Walk right! Walk right! They were climbing a gentle rise now. When they reached the top, they weren't in Luxembourg anymore. They were in Germany. A motion picture camera was set up at the border to record the fabulous victory. Two civilians in bearskin coats were leaning on the camera when Billy and Weary came by. They had run out of film hours ago. One of them singled out Billy's face for a moment, then focused at Infinity again. There was a tiny plume of smoke at Infinity. There was a battle there. People were dying there. So it goes. And the sun went down, and Billy found himself bobbing in place in a railroad yard. There were rows and rows of boxcars waiting. They had brought reserves to the front. Now they were going to take prisoners into Germany's interior. Flashlight beams danced crazily. The Germans sorted out the prisoners according to rank. They put sergeants with sergeants, majors with majors, and so on. A squad of full colonels was halted near Billy. One of them had double pneumonia. He had a high fever and vertigo. As the railroad yard dipped and swooped around the colonel, he tried to hold himself steady by staring into Billy's eyes. The colonel coughed and coughed, and then he said to Billy, You one of my boys? This was a man who had lost an entire regiment, about 4,500 men, a lot of them children, actually. Billy didn't reply. The question made no sense. What was your outfit? said the colonel. He coughed and coughed. Every time he inhaled, his lungs rattled like greasy paper bags. Billy couldn't remember the outfit he was from. You from the 40, 451st? 451st what? said Billy. There was silence. Infantry regiment said the colonel at last. Oh, said Billy Pilgrim. There was another long silence, with the colonel dying and dying, drowning where he stood. And then he cried out wetly, It's me, boys, it's Wild Bob! That is what he always wanted his troops to call him, Wild Bob. None of the people who could hear him were actually from his regiment, except for Roland Weary, and Weary wasn't listening. All Weary could think of was the agony in his own feet. But the colonel imagined that he was addressing his beloved troops for the last time, and he told them that they had nothing to be ashamed of, that there were dead Germans all over the battlefield who wished to God that they had never heard of the 451st. He said that after the war he was going to have a regimental reunion in his hometown, which was Cody, Wyoming. 
He was going to barbecue whole steers. He said all this while staring into Billy's eyes. He made the inside of poor Billy's skull echo with balderdash. God be with you, boys, he said, and then it echoed and echoed. And then he said, if you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, just ask for Wild Bob. I was there. So was my old war buddy, Bernard V. O'Hare. Billy Pilgrim was packed into a boxcar with many other privates. He and Roland Weary were separated. Weary was packed into another car in the same train. There were narrow ventilators at the corners of the car, under the eaves. Billy stood by one of these, and, as the crowd pressed against him, he climbed part up, part way up a diagonal corner brace to make more room. This placed his eyes on a level with a ventilator, so he could see another train about ten yards away. Germans were riding in the cars with blue chalk, the number of persons in each car, their rank, their nationality, the date on which they had been put aboard. Other Germans were securing the hasps on the car doors with a wire and spikes and other trackside trash. Billy could hear somebody riding on his car, too, but he couldn't see who was doing it. Most of the privates on Billy's car were very young, at the end of childhood, but crammed into the corner with Billy was a former hobo who was forty years old. I've been hungrier than this, the hobo told Billy. I've been in worse places than this. This ain't so bad. A man in a boxcar across the way called out through the ventilator that a man had just died in there. So it goes. There were four guards who heard him. They weren't excited by the news. Yo, yo, said one, nodding dreamily. Yo, yo. And the guards didn't open the car with the dead man in it. They opened the next car instead. And Billy Pilgrim was enchanted by what was in there. It was like heaven. There was candlelight, and there were bunks with quilts and blankets heaped on them. There was a cannonball stove with a steaming coffee pot on top. There was a table with a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread and a sausage on it. There were four bowls of soup. There were pictures of castles and lakes and pretty girls on the walls. This was the rolling home of the railroad guards, men whose business it was to be forever guarding freight rolling from here to there. The four guards went inside and closed the door. A little while later they came out of smoking cigars, talking contentedly in the mellow lower register of the German language. One of them saw Billy's face at the ventilator. He wagged a finger at him in affectionate warning, telling him to be a good boy. The Americans across the way told the guards again about the dead man on their car. The guards got a stretcher out of their own cozy car, opened the dead man's car, and went inside. The dead man's car wasn't crowded at all. There was just six live colonels in there and one dead one. The Germans carried the corpse out. The corpse was Wild Bob. So it goes. During the night, some of the locomotives began to tootle to one another, and then to move. The locomotive and the last car of the, each train were marked with a striped banner of orange and black, indicating that the train was not fair game for airplanes, that it was carrying prisoners of war. The war was nearly over. The locomotives began to move east in late December. The war would end in May. German prisoners everywhere were absolutely full, and there were no longer any food for the prisoners to eat, and no longer any fuel to keep them warm. And yet, and yet, here came more prisoners. Billy Pilgrim's train, the longest train of all, did not move for two days. This ain't bad, the hobo told Billy on the second day. This ain't nothing at all. Billy looked out through the ventilator. The railroad yard was a desert now, except for a hospital train marked with red crosses, on a siding far, far away, its locomotive whistled. The locomotive of Billy Pilgrim's train whistled back. They were saying, hello. Even though Billy's train wasn't moving, the boxcars were kept locked tight. Nobody was to get off until the final destination. To the guards who walked up and down outside, each car became a single organism which ate and drank and excreted through its ventilators. It talked, or sometimes yelled through its ventilators, too. In went water and loaves and of black bread and sausage and cheese. Out came shit and piss and language. Human beings were in there, excreting into steel helmets, which were passed to the people at the ventilators, who dumped them. Billy was a dumper. The human beings also passed canteens, which guards would fill with water. When food came in, the human beings were quiet and trusting and beautiful. They shared. Human beings in there took turns standing or lying down. The legs of those who stood were like fence posts, driven into warm, squirming, farting, sighing earth. The queer earth was a mosaic of sleepers who nestled like spoons. Now the train began to creep eastward. Somewhere in there was Christmas. Billy Pilgrim nestled like a spoon with the hobo on Christmas night, and he fell asleep, 
and he traveled in time to 1967 again, to the night he was kidnapped by a flying saucer from Trafalmador. Chapter 4 Billy Pilgrim could not sleep on his daughter's wedding night. He was 44. The wedding had taken place that afternoon in a gaily striped tent in Billy's backyard. The stripes were orange and black. Billy and his wife, Valencia, nestled like spoons in their big double bed. They were jiggled by magic fingers. Valencia didn't need to be jiggled to sleep. Valencia was snoring like a bandsaw. The poor woman didn't have ovaries or a uterus anymore. They had been removed by a surgeon, by one of Billy's partners, partners in the new Holiday Inn. There was a full moon. Billy got out of bed in the moonlight. He felt spooky and luminous, felt as though he were wrapped in cool fur that was full of static electricity. He looked down at his bare feet. They were ivory and blue. Billy now shuffled down his upstairs hallway, knowing he was about to be kidnapped by a flying saucer. The hallway was zebra-striped, with darkness and moonlight. The moonlight came into the hallway, through the doorways of the empty rooms of Billy's two children. Children no more. They were gone forever. Billy was guided by dread, and the lack of dread. Dread told him when to stop. Lack of it told him when to move again. He stopped. He went into his daughter's room. Her drawers were dumped. Her closet was empty. Heaped in the middle of her room were all her possessions she could not take on a honeymoon. She had a princess telephone, extensions all her own, on her windowsill. Its tiny night light stared at Billy, and then it rang. Billy answered. There was a drunk on the other end. Billy could almost smell his breath, mustard gas and roses. It was the wrong number. Billy hung up. There was a soft drink bottle on the windowsill. Its label boasted that it contained no nourishment whatsoever. Billy Pilgrim padded downstairs on his blue and ivory feet. He went into the kitchen, where the moonlight called his attention to the half bottle of champagne on the kitchen table, all that was left from the reception in the tent. Somebody had stoppered it again. Drink me, it seemed to say. So Billy uncorked it with his thumbs. It didn't make a pop. The champagne was dead. So it goes. Billy looked at the clock on the glass gas stove. He had an hour to kill before the saucer came. He went into the living room, swinging the bottle like a dinner bell, turned on the television. He came slightly unstuck in time, saw the late movie backwards, then forwards again. It was a movie about American bombers in the Second World War and the gallant men who flew them. Seen backwards by Billy, the stor story went like this. American planes, full of holes, and wounded men and corpses corpses took off backwards from an airfield in England. Over France, a few German fighter planes flew at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. They did the same for wrecked American bombers on the ground, and those planes flew up backwards to join the formation. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened up their bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism, which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from the crewmen and planes. But there were still a few wounded Americans, though, and some of the bombers were in bad repair. Over France, though, German fighters came up again, made everything and everybody as good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was ma mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly, so they would never hurt anybody ever again. The American flyers turned in their uniforms, became high school kids, and Hitler turned into a baby, Billy Pilgrim supposed. That wasn't in the movie. Billy was extrapolating. Everybody turned into a baby. And all humanity, without exception, conspired biologically to produce two perfect people named Adam and Eve, he supposed. Billy saw the war movies backwards, and then forwards. And then it was time to go out into his backyard to meet the flying saucer. Out he went, his blue and ivory feet crushing the wet salad of the lawn. He stopped took a swig of the dead champagne. It was like seven up. He would not raise his eyes to the sky, though he knew there was a flying saucer from Chalfamador up there. He would see it soon enough, inside and out. And he would see, too, where it came from soon enough, soon enough. 
Overhead, he heard the cry of what might have been a melodious owl, but it wasn't a melodious owl. It was a flying saucer from Chalfmador, navigating in both space and time, therefore seeming to Billy Pilgrim to have come from nowhere all at once. Somewhere, a big dog barked. The saucer was 100 feet in diameter, with portholes around its rim. The light from the portholes was a pulsing purple. The only noise it made was the owl song. It came down to hover over Billy, and to enclose him in a cylinder of pulsing purple light. Now there was a sound of a seeming kiss as an airtight hatch in the bottom of the saucer opened. Down smacked, snaked a ladder that was outlined in pretty lights like a ferris wheel. Billy's will was paralyzed by a zap gun aimed at him from one of the portholes. It became imperative that he take hold of the bottom rung of the sinuous ladder, which he did. That rung was electrified so that Billy's hands locked onto it hard. He was hauled onto the airlock, and machinery closed the bottom door. Only then did the ladder, wound onto a reel with an airlock, let him go. Only then did Billy's brain start working again. There were two peepholes inside the airlock, with yellow eyes pressed to them. There was a speaker on the wall. The Chalfmadorians had no voice boxes. They communicated telepathically. They were able to talk to Billy by means of a computer and a sort of electronic electric organ which made everything earthling speech sound. Welcome aboard, Mr. Pilgrim, said the loudspeaker. Any questions? Billy licked his lips, thought a while, inquired at last. Why me? That is a very earthling question to ask, Mr. Pilgrim. Why you? Why us, for that matter? Why anything? Because this moment simply is. Have you ever seen bugs trapped in amber? Yes. Billy, in fact, had a paperweight in his office, which was a blob of polished amber with three ladybugs embedded in it. Well, here we are, Mr. Pilgrim, trapped in the amber of this moment. There is no why. They introduced an anesthetic into Billy's atmosphere now, put him to sleep. They carried him to a cabin where he was strapped to a yellow barca lounger, which they had stolen from a Sears Roebuck warehouse. The hold of the saucer was crammed with other stolen merchandise, which would be used to furnish Billy's artificial habitat in the zoo on Trophimador. The terrific acceleration of the saucer as it left Earth twisted Billy's slumbering body, distorted his face, dislodged him in time, sent him back to the war. When he regained consciousness, he wasn't on the flying saucer. He was in a boxcar crossing Germany again. Some of the people were rising from the floor of the car, and others were laying down. Billy planned to lie down, too. It would be lovely to sleep. It was black in the car, and black outside the car, which seemed to be going about two miles an hour. The car never seemed to go any faster than that. It was a long time between clicks, between joints in the track. There would be a click, and then a year would go by, and then there would be another click. The train often stopped to let really important trains ball and hurtle by. Another thing it did was stop on sidings near prisons, leaving a few cars there. It was creeping across all of Germany, growing shorter all the time. And Billy let himself down, oh so great gradually now, hanging on to the diagonal cross brace in the corner in order to make himself seem nearly weightless to those he was joining on the floor. He knew it was important that he make himself nearly ghost-like when lying down. He'd forgotten why, but a reminder soon came. Pilgrim, said a person he was about to nestle with. Is that you? Billy didn't say anything, but nestled very politely closed his eyes. God damn it, said the person. That is you, isn't it? He sat up and explored Billy rudely with his hands. It's you, all right. Get the hell out of here. Now Billy sat up, too, wretched, close to tears. Get out of here. I want to sleep. Shut up, said somebody else. I'll shut up when Pilgrim gets away from here. So Billy stood up again, clung to the cross brace. Where can I sleep? He asked quietly. Not with me. Not with me, you son of a bitch, said somebody else. You yell, you kick. I do? You're goddamn right you do, and whimper. I do? Keep the hell away from here, pilgrim. And now there was an acrimonious madrigal, with parts sun in all quarters of the car. Nearly everybody, seemingly, had an atrocity story of something Billy Pilgrim had done to them in his sleep. Everybody told Billy Pilgrim to keep the hell away. So Billy Pilgrim had to sleep standing up or not sleep at all, and food had stopped coming in through the ventilators, and the days and nights were colder all the time. On the eighth day, the forty-year-old hobo said to Billy, This ain't bad. I can be comfortable anywhere. You can? said Billy. On the ninth day, the hobo died. So it goes. 
His last words were, you think this is bad? This ain't bad. There was something about death in the ninth day. There was a death on the ninth day in the car ahead of Billy's, too. Roland Weary died of gangrene that had started in his mangled feet. So it goes. Weary, in his nearly continuous delirium, told again and again of the three musketeers, acknowledged that he was dying, gave many messages to be delivered to his family in Pittsburgh. Above all, he wanted to be avenged, so he said again and again the name of the person who had killed him. Everyone on the car learned the lesson well. Who killed me? he would ask, and everybody knew the answer, which was this, Billy Pilgrim. Listen, on the tenth night the peg was pulled out of the hasp on Billy's box car door, and the door was opened. Billy Pilgrim was lying at an angle on the corner brace, self-crucified, holding himself there with a blue and ivory claw hooked over the sill of the ventilator. Billy coughed when the door was opened, and when he coughed he shit thin, he shit thin gruel. This was in accordance with the third law of motion according to Sir Isaac Newton. This law tells us that for every action there is a reaction which is equal and opposite in direction. This can be useful in rocketry. The train had arrived on a siding by a prison which was originally constructed as an extermination camp for Russian prisoners of war. The guards peeked inside Billy's car owlishly, cooed calmingly. They had never dealt with Americans before, but they surely understood this general sort of freight. They knew that it was essentially a liquid which could be introduced to flow slowly toward cooing and light. It was night time. The only light outside came from a single bulb which hung from a pole high and far away. All was quiet outside, except for the guards, who cooed like doves, and the liquid began to flow. Gobs of it built up in the doorway, plopped to the ground. Billy was the next to last human being to reach the door. The hobo was last. The hobo could not flow, could not plop. He wasn't liquid anymore. He was stone. So it goes. Billy didn't want to drop from the car to the ground. He sincerely believed that he would shatter like glass, so the guards helped him down, cooing still. They set him down facing the train. It was such a dinky train now. There was a locomotive, a tender, and three little boxcars. The last, bo the last boxcar was the railroad guard's heaven on wheels. Again, in that heaven on wheels, the table was set. Dinner was served. At the base of the pole, from which the light bulb hung, were three seeming haystacks. The Americans were wheeled and teased over to those three stacks, which weren't hay at all. They were overcoats taken for prisoners who were dead. So it goes. It was the guard's firmly expressed wish that every American without an overcoat should take one. The coats were cemented together with ice, so the guards used their bayonets to, as ice picks pricking free collars and hems and sleeves and so on, then peeling off coats and handing them out at random. The coats were stiff and dome-shaped, having conformed to their piles. The coat that Billy Pilgrim got had been crumpled and frozen in such a way, and was so small that it appeared to not be a coat, but a sort of large black three-cornered hat. There were gummy stains on it, too, like crankcase drainings or old strawberry jam. There seemed to be a dead, furry animal frozen to it. The animal was, in fact, the coat's fur collar. Billy glanced dully at the coats of his neighbors. Their coats all had brass buttons or tinsel or piping or numbers or stripes or eagles or moons or stars dangling from them. They were soldiers' coats. Billy was the only one who had a coat of a dead civilian. So it goes. And Billy and the rest were encouraged to shuffle around their dinky train and on to, into the prison camp. There wasn't anything warm or lively to attract them, merely long, low, narrow sheds by the thousands with no lights inside. Somewhere a dog barked. With the help of fear and echoes and winter silences, that dog had a voice like a big bronze gong. Billy and the rest were wooed through gate after gate, and Billy saw his first Russian. The man was all alone in the night, a ragbag with a round, flat face that glowed like a radium dial. Billy passed within a yard of him. There was a barbed wire between them. The Russian did not wave or speak, but he looked directly into Billy's soul with sweet hopefulness, as though Billy might have good news for him. News he might be too stupid to understand, but good news all the same. Billy blacked out as he walked through gate after gate. He came to in what he thought might be a building on Trafalgar. It was shrilly lit and lined with white tiles. It was on earth, though. It was a delousing station through which all the prisoners had to pass. Billy did as he was told, took off his clothes, 
That was the first thing they told him to do on Trophimador, too. A German measured Billy's upper right arm with his thumb and forefinger, asked a companion what sort of an army would send a weakling like that to the front. They looked at the other American bodies now, pointed out a lot more they were not nearly as bad as Billy's. One of the best bodies belonged to the oldest American by far, a high school teacher from Indianapolis. His name was Edgar Derby. He hadn't been in Billy's boxcar. He'd been enrolling Weary's car, had cradled Weary's head when he died, so it goes. Derby was 44 years old. He was so old he had a son who was a Marine in the Pacific Theater of War. Derby had pulled political wires to get into the Army at his age. The subject he had taught in Indianapolis was contemporary problems in Western civilization. He also coached the tennis team and took very good care of his body. Derby's son would survive the war. Derby wouldn't. That good body of his would be filled with holes by a firing squad in Dresden in 68 days. So it goes. The worst American body wasn't Billy's. The worst body belonged to a car thief from Cicero, Illinois. His name was Paul Lazaro. He was tiny, and not only were his bones and teeth rotten, but his skin was disgusting. Lazaro was poked dotted all over with dime-sized scars. He had had many plagues of boils. Lazaro, too, had been on Roland Weary's boxcar, and had given his word of honor to Weary that he would find some way to make Billy Pilgrim pay for Weary's death. He was looking around now, wondering which naked human being was Billy. The naked Americans took their places under many shower heads along the white-tiled wall. There were no faucets they could control. They could only wait for whatever was coming. Their penises were shriveled and their balls were retracted. Reproduction was not the main business of the evening. An unseen hand turned a master valve. Out of the shower heads gushed scalding rain. The rain was a blowtorch that did not warm. It jazzed and jangled Billy's skin without thawing the ice in the marrow of his long bones. The American's clothes were, meanwhile, passing through poisonous gas. Body lice and bacteria and fleas were dying by the billions. So it goes. And Billy zoomed back in time to his infancy. He was a baby who had just been bathed by his mother. Now his mother wrapped him in a towel, carried him into a rosy room that was filled with sunshine. She enwrapped him, laid him on the tickling towel, powdered him between his legs, joked with him, patted his little jelly belly. Her palm and his jelly belly made pouching sounds. Billy gurgled and cooed. And then Billy was a middle-aged optometrist again, playing hacker's golf this time, on a blazing sun, summer Sunday morning. Billy never went to church anymore. He was hacking with three other optometrists. Billy on the green in seven strokes, and it was his turn to putt. It was an eight-foot putt, and he made it. He bent over to take the ball out of the cup, and the sun went behind a cloud. Billy was momentarily dizzy. When he recovered, he wasn't on the golf course anymore. He was strapped to a yellow contour chair in a white chamber aboard a flying saucer, which was bound for Trafalgar. Where am I? said Billy Pilgrim. Trapped in another blob of amber, Mr. Pilgrim. We are where we have to be just now, three hundred million miles from Earth, bound for a time warp which will get us to Trafalgar in hours rather than centuries. How, how did I get here? It would take another Earthling to explain it to you. Earthlings are the great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. I am a Trophimadorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warnings or explanations. It simply is. Take it moment by moment, and you will find that we are all, as I've said before, bugs in amber. You sound to me as though you don't believe in free will, said Billy Pilgrim. If I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, said the Trophimadorian, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe, and I've studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will.